Let's say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you would open my eyes to see and my ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in Jesus' name. And help that preacher. Amen. God is good. God is good. Well, last week I was talking, I started a message called Be, be Careful How You Hear. Be careful how you hear. And um, there's something that God has been speaking to me over the last year, and that is this, this whole principle of not laying again the foundations, right? It says in Hebrews, let's not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, the laying on of hands, and resurrection of the dead. But let's, let us move on to perfection, amen? And so I believe that God wants us to move on to perfection. He wants us to grow in our faith from glory to glory because even the creation is waiting for the unveiling of the sons of God. Amen? And, you know, how would you feel if you walked by a construction site and you saw all the carpenters uh, finishing off a basement? They have the foundation laid. They've got the drywall done. They've got the paint done. They've got the couch and the furniture, and they're sitting there watching TV. You look down and say, there's a problem here. You guys are hanging out in the foundation. Right? It would be odd. What about the second floor? What about the third floor? What about all the stuff that's supposed to be built on the foundation? I think that if we're not careful as a church, we hang out in, in, in the foundation. How many hear what I'm saying? And God wants us to move on. God wants us to grow. God wants us to, rev- to, to know who we are in him. And the, the blessings that are ours are him. The authority we have as a believer. God wants us to grow. And the enemy would like to see us just stay and hang out in the foundations because they're, they're, the foundation can never be moved, which is Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about changing the foundation. I'm talking about building on the foundation. And so I wanted to, as I did last week, some of this is a bit of review, but I really feel we need to bring it home, is in Mark chapter 4, Jesus is speaking to, um, to his disciples and he's explaining a parable. And this is a parable that is the parable of all parables. He said to his disciples, if you don't understand this, how are you going to understand the rest of the book? How are you going to understand other parables? And so he is explaining about the, uh, the sower and the seed. But we're going to bypass that. We're going to come back to it. As he's continuing with the parable in verse, uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 26 and 27, he says, the kingdom of God is as a man should scatter seed on the ground. It's just kind of like a man who's scattering seed. And... Uh, He should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. Anyone anyone who's a farmer, done any gardening, understands that. We just do, we plant the seed, and all by itself it grows. Now the soil is what, where the seed is planted. The soil is our hearts, right? So all by itself, your heart will produce fruit. It will produce a crop. Very, very important principle. Okay, and um, so so we have to understand that that the Lord's prayer is this that that His kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. How many know that? May Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. But what is the kingdom? A kingdom is an ideology. The kingdom of God is a worldview. It's 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 the culture of heaven, and it has to come through us, right? Jesus said, so let your light shine before all men. That light is the kingdom culture. It's the kingdom ideology. It's the way things are in heaven are supposed to be manifested in our lives. So your family should run the way it would run in heaven. Amen? You should have a good relationship. God wants you to have good relationships. Say, God wants me to have good relationships. So, so the kingdom of God has to flow through us. Okay? And um, the, the key is this. Mark chapter 4, verse 24 to 25, okay, says this. And then he said, Jesus says to them, take heed what you hear, and actually says in Luke how you hear, with the same measure you, you, uh, you use, it will be measured back to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. For whatever, whoever has, to him more will be given, but whoever does not have, what he has will be taken away from him, okay? And so, so we understand this principle here, that proper revelation produces transformation. Okay? Proper revelation will produce transformation. Jesus said, if you believe in me, as the scriptures have said, out of your belly will flow rivers of dead water. No, it doesn't say that. Of course not. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water, right? But, but it's not just believing in Jesus, but it's believing as the scriptures 
have said. So proper revelation produces transformation, but improper revelation produces regulation segregation. Right? It's all about regulations. What, do I, what can I do? What can I do? Uh, my life is limited. I can do the buy. It's all about rules and regulations. It's all about segregation. This denomination believes that. This denomination believes this. Right? I, we got to get past that as believers. We need to move on to the image of Christ. Can anyone say amen? And so what Jesus is doing is he's appealing for spiritual perception. Okay? He, he, he's actually saying those who receive and assimilate the truth correctly will have the capacity for understanding. Those who, uh, they'll enlarge their knowledge, their knowledge will increase. Those who disbelieve or are indifferent to the word of God lose whatever ability or understanding they had and therefore they will continue to live in ignorance. That's a lot to say. But God wants us, God wants us to, to walk in revelation so we can have transformation. And so easy... It's so easy to get to a place in our life where uh, we get so, the Word of God becomes commonplace. Right? And I like the King James Version. I believe it's the most accurate as far as, you know, going back to the King James. But sometimes it's good to grab a new translation just to read it so you can see it differently. Because it becomes, it just becomes systematic in our minds. Okay? And last week I talked about a guy, an Episcopalian guy. Uh, who was a believer, but he wasn't really on fire for God. He, he just kind of went to church, and he had this dream. Some of you, this is a recap, but he had a dream. And in the dream, he went into a home, and he was holding this baby, this child, and this child was crying. And in the dream, he prayed for the child, and the child got healed. He had the dream over and over again. So he went to his pastor, and he said, Hey, what is this all about? He went to the priest. The priest said, I have no idea about these spiritual things, so go to somebody else. So he finally went to a pastor who understood dreams and interpretation. And he said, I think God's trying to show you something. And next thing you know, as he's a businessman, he shows up at one of his customer's house to, to deliver a part. He shows up and he hears a baby crying in the room. So he goes into the room. This baby's crying. The, the father's not there, but the mother says, my baby drank gasoline by accident, thinking it was apple juice. And now the stomach liner is, is eaten away and the child is in constant pain. There's nothing we can do. And uh, every time the child eats, it cries and cries and cries. And so he looks at the baby and he goes... Dear, I had a dream, and this is the baby in my dream. Can I hold the baby? Can I do what I did in the dream and pray? She said, okay. So he did, and she was, the baby was instantly healed. How many remember that story? So then he goes, hey, man, there must be a call of God in my life. So he went to Bible school. He went to a liberal Bible college to get his degree, and they taught him the word incorrectly. Be careful how you hear and they started to teach him that, that these scriptures have passed away and God did miracles through the apostles. And they started to teach stuff that was contrary to the simple word of God. And he went through Bible college and he ended up suicidal and depressed and ended up with a gun at his head. He was going to kill himself. When the Lord spoke to him, he repented and he started a church. Right? So you guys remember that story from last week. So sometimes certain truths are assimilated and taught incorrectly so what do we have to do as a people? We need to study to show ourselves approved. Okay, number one. Number two, we need to become fruit inspectors. Right? We have to inspect, because a tree is known by its fruit. So you have to look at the fruit. If the fruit that's being produced is love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, the fruit of the Spirit is coming out of this ministry, then you can say, I can, I can tag into that because it's producing fruit. You hear what I'm saying? So number one, you have to you have study to show yourself approved. Let become fruit inspectors, but most importantly, let Scripture interpret Scripture. If you find one Scripture that says something you want, hey, this is great. I think it means this, but every other Scripture kind of contradicts it. Then that's not a good a good way of looking at the Scripture. Amen. And I want to give you one clear example of that that you guys have probably heard. It's in Isaiah chapter 55, verse eight and nine. So if we can bring up that Scripture. Isaiah 58, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are far beyond anything you could ever imagine. Now, how many, for just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. How many have ever heard that quoted? It's usually at a funeral where someone died of some mysterious illness or something negative happens in life, and we say, well, we just don't understand God's ways. For his ways are higher. It becomes mysterious. How many know what, you know what I'm talking about? Something negative happened or something we don't quite understand. And this is quoted out of context. 
How many know context is important? Well, what, it, what, is, what is the scripture talking about? If we go to the verses, verse 6 and 7, just before that, it, look what it says here. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish their very thoughts of wrongdoing. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to God, for he will forgive generously. So what it's saying here, the context of this verse is saying, the Lord's ways are not your ways. You're not generous and you don't forgive well. But God does. And how the enemy can take a scripture like that and give it negative connotations so that we, we, we see God incorrectly. Does anyone hear what I'm saying? Yes. All right? God is not, he, he has a great heart. He wants to forgive generously. He wants to show mercy. But we use that scripture out of context. Okay? And so, verse 10 and 11. Go to verse 10 and 11. The rain and snow come down on the, on the, from the heavens, stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. Verse 11. It is the same with my word. I send it out. It always, say always, produces fruit. It will accomplish what I want it to. It will prosper in whatever I send it. And so God is, he's, I, I'm, he's sending the weather, he's, he's sending out seed, he's taking care of the hungry, he's willing to forgive, he's generous, and then we take the scripture verse in between and we use it to try to explain how God's mysterious. Anyone see that? And so this happens all the time. That's why you have to study in context, say in context. All right? Very, very important. And so I want to go back to the sower for a minute in Mark chapter 4. Okay, and we understand when Jesus is explaining it, I'm just going to give you the quick rundown. He talks about three types of soil. He talks about the wayside. So some seeds are scattered on the wayside, right? And many times the wayside speaks of a hard surface. Maybe people have walked on your life. Maybe you've been abused and you have a hard time trusting people. You have a hard heart. Sometimes it can represent pride. But the seed cannot penetrate the soil of your heart, so the enemy comes immediately and snatches it away. The second soil is the stony ground. The stony ground is important as well. And then there's thorns, which is the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. And what I've learned here is that I can be all three of these at the same time on the same day. You know what I mean? Because there's, there's days I get up and it's like, I'm all concerned about the care. My minds are on the cares of this world. You know, how am I going to pay my bills? And how am I going to do with this? And what's my future going to look? I'm thinking about the cares of this world. And then also now I've been hurt. I'm a little bitter at Jackie at church because Jackie said something to me or, or somebody said something to me and now I'm offended. And, and now, now there's, there's the next, and I just use that name. There's not a Jackie here. So, um, uh, and then, then there's other times where, where uh, I have no self-esteem and I'm concerned. And, I'm think- and when you're thinking like that, when your mind and your heart is in that negative state, the word of God doesn't bear much fruit. But when you have a good heart, that seed takes root and grows some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And that's why it's so important that we guard our hearts for out of it flows the issues of life. Okay? And so here's the thing. I want to talk for a few minutes about stony ground. I know I touched on it last week, but I think it's really important. In verse 17, Jesus is speaking about stony ground. He says, They have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterwards, when tribulation and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Okay? This is so important because um, some people can't handle rejection. And that was, a, that was a struggle for me when I became a believer and I went to Bible school. I loved Jesus. And I, I signed up and I forced myself to do evangelism. I would go out on the street. But I, I realized very quickly that I, I struggled with rejection because when people would reject me, throw the track in my face, you know, say, you're crazy, it really bothered me inside. And Jesus is saying those who have no root in themselves, they have no self-confidence. It says that when persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately, say immediately, they stumble. And I found myself stumbling. I found myself struggling because of persecution. And what it was rooted in was, is my self-confidence. I didn't have enough self-confidence. Maybe some of you can relate to this. Uh, but God wants, to, um, he wants us to grow in confidence. 
He wants to reveal his glory in us, right? He wants to reveal who he is in us. The word glory means kabod. Say kabod. That's, that's actually the Greek word. It actually means riches. It means honor, dignity, reputation, and reverence. Okay? And, and so God wants us to have spiritual riches. He wants us to be honored. He wants us to have dignity. He wants us to have a good reputation. He wants us to have reverence. You should be your best friend. outside. You should love God with all your heart, and you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. You should love yourself. You should love hanging out with yourself. I mean, there was a time in my life where I hated to be by myself. I'd get off work, and I'd be like, I can go to the movies, and then after the movies, I'm going to go to you know, Starbucks. And I'm, I just didn't want to be alone. I had my own apartment, because when I got alone, I started realizing I didn't like myself. How many hear what I'm saying? But, but I needed a revelation of God's glory. I needed to know the riches and honor and dignity and reverence he has for me. In Isaiah chapter 6, and we don't have to turn there, the seraphim angels come before the Lord and they cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his holiness. Is that what it says? No, it says the whole earth is filled with his glory. So holy, the holiness of God produces glory. You hear what I'm saying? The holiness of God produces the glory of God. It produces, holiness produces riches, it produces honor, it produces reputation, it produces reverence, it produces a life. You know, Dave, King David says, your word is sweet. You know, your law is, is like gold. He, he, he loved it. It was like the taste of honey in the honeycomb, right? He talked about the law of the Lord. And the enemy wants us to think that holiness is legalism, and it's not. When you get holy, when you deal with your character issues, when you deal with the issues in your life, and you begin to walk like God, the next thing you know, there's spiritual richness that comes into your life. There's honor, there's dignity, there's reputation. You begin to feel the presence of God all the time. You don't have to come to a worship service to get stirred up. You get up in the morning, and you feel the presence of God. You feel the love of God. You walk around all day shining, and people say, hey, what's up with you? What's different about what's happening? The glory of the Lord is shining through you. And the enemy says, you know, you don't want to talk about repentance. You don't want to talk about holiness. You know, that's all legalism. But the reality is, it produces the glory of God. Why am I changing my ways? Why am I cleaning up my life? It's because the glory of God is going to shine through me. Isn't that good news? You know, we can't earn God's glory. We can't add to God's glory. Um, the only thing we do is submit to the process of God and let the glory shine through us. How many want the glory of God to shine through you? All right? And here's the truth. You guys want a truth statement? John chapter 17, verse 22, 23 says this. Jesus says, I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. So there's an Old Testament saying, people say, you know, God shares his glory with no man. That's not true. God has given, say, God has given me his glory. He shared it with you. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to wait for Pentecost. You don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. You don't have to wait for the manifest. It belongs to you. Do do you get that? All right? And then he says, and then this even gets better. I am in them, you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. So say with me, God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. So if Jesus is standing here and, God, and, and you're standing here and you said to God, God, I need you to choose who are you going to like destroy, Jesus or are you going to destroy and put your name there? Okay? And God would be like, oh man, that's a hard one. I, you know, I can't. I can't destroy them. I, I love them both. He loves you as much as he loves the third per- or second person of the Trinity, his son, Jesus Christ. If we could get that in our spirit, if we could wake up in the morning and say, man, God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. I'm in... I'm in good place. How would that change the way you look at yourself? You say, I don't like myself and I'm no good for nothing. You're actually saying that you don't believe in God or what he believes in because he believes in you. 
And God wants us to get this revelation deep inside of us. This is the foundation block for all doctrine. And we have to understand first and foremost that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to save your sorry butt. My translation. Right? That's how much God loves us. And if we could get that in our spirit, that's got to be our prayer every day. God, open the eyes of my understanding that I might know. I want, like Paul talked about having this, the, the eyes of an understanding open that he would know the hope of the calling and the love and the power that God has given to us. Isn't that good? So we're moving on. Okay? And so the starting block for receiving God's glory and living it is standing on the fact of what God says about you, that he loves you unconditionally, and that he's already given you his glory, because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Isn't that good? Because God can only walk through the doorway of your understanding. It's called faith. If you understand a truth, God can walk through your life. If you don't understand that truth, you're shut off for that promise. And that's why it's so important that we keep... I keep talking about this. We need to get this in our spirit, right? And so... Um, so there's two things God wants to reveal to you. Two things. Number one, he wants to reveal himself, and he wants to reveal ourselves to us. God wants, he has a purpose for you. You're not a mistake. He said to, he said to uh, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I pre-appointed you to be a prophet to the nations, to speak the word of the Lord. He had a purpose. How many know that you have a purpose? God has a plan for you. You're not here as a mistake. God saw that there was a problem in the earth. He says, I, there's a problem that's going to come up in the earth, and I need to create a, a solution to that problem, so he created you. To come into the world as a solution to a problem, to bring the glory of God into the earth, and then you got the devil, and sometimes it can be friends and parents and other people who speak negative over you all the time to, to pull you down, but God says great things over you. Amen? Amen? So, let's move on. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, this is what the Bible says. God made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings because he has a plan and you get to be part of it. This is good news. Say, I'm ordained to be an answer to a problem. You say, I don't, know what, I don't know what the will of God is for my life. Do you know how you find out what the will of God is for your life? Sit down and start writing out your dreams. What's in your heart? Oh, I really want to help people. I want to be a doctor. I, want, I just really like to help sick people. Well, that was put there by God. That's what your design is. That's what your purpose is. If you get up and go to work and you, you hate your job and you can't wait to get home, you're probably not in your purpose. Because God has pre-wired you for a purpose. And so, so this is how we know the purpose of God in our lives, right? And so, um, and then there's the issue of confidence. You know, there's, there's confidence and there's competence. And so, some people lack one or the other. For me, uh, I'm very confident. I don't have a lot of competence. <laughs> I'm getting better. But to give you an example of a confident person, like when I was in Bible school, you know, we would get together to study for our final exams, me and my wife. Well, I was more interested in looking at her than my, my work, right? I didn't care about my work. So I would read over it once or twice, and I'd say, I'll, I'll, pr I'll probably pass. It's probably good. That's good enough, right? And then I would, you know, get sidetracked by other things. She would study until she memorized the whole course. I would just kind of guess at what to study. And so I'd get a C, and I'd be like, okay, at least I passed. Good enough. But she had to get the A and become the honor roll student, right? Because for her, she's like, I, the, the competence, it's got it's to be perfect. I, I got to know my stuff. I got to know my stuff. For me, it was just nah, whatever, right? Um, but you know what? When you a job interview, many times the, the, uh, the, the confident person will get the job over the competent person. It happens all the time because someone comes in, they hold them, say, yeah, I can do it. I can, yeah, no problem. Yeah. And they okay, let's hire this person. They know what they're doing. The next person comes in kind of shy and with no confidence, but they, they've got degrees and they, they, they know how to do the job and, and they don't get the job. How many know what I'm talking about? God wants you to be, he wants you to be competent, but he also wants you to be confident. Amen. God wants you to be confident that you can do what God has called you to do. Okay? 
I had a friend growing up in high school. His, his name was Derek. And he was the most incompetent person I knew, but he was the most confident person I knew. And if, he listen, if you're listening to this message, Derek, online, uh, love you, brother. Uh, but anyway... I mean, he just, I mean, he missed more school than he, than he attended as far. He just, he, he wasn't very competent, but he was so confident that everybody loved him. Everybody wanted to hang out with Derek. He was so, he'd walk in a room and he'd light up the room and he'd, hey, how's it going? And he was just kind of like so confident in everything he did. He, you know, oh, I'm going to try skateboarding. And he'd drop in on a 12 foot ramp and crack his head open, you know, and people were like, this guy's cool, right? And he was so confident. All right? And then, and then he gets saved, and, and, and I'm telling you, we were, we were called Cheech and Chong, and some of you will figure out what that was. So, I mean, he was Cheech, I was Chong, right? We were in, in the wrong lifestyle. But anyway, uh, the thing is, he gets saved. I get him saved after I come back to the Lord, and this confidence is just coming out of him. And he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go tell everyone about Jesus. I said, what are you going to do? He goes, well, I'm going to take a crucifix. You know a crucifix from the Catholic Church, and it has Jesus on there. And he says, I'm going to take a paper clip. I'm going to take the crucifix off. I'm going to take the paper clip. I'm going to put Jesus up, hanging up above the crucifix, and I'll wear it. And when I go to talk to people, they all say, how come Jesus is being held up by paper clip? He goes, well, because he's no longer on the cross. He rose from the dead. Let me tell you about it. And this is what he would do. He wrote on the back of his jacket, you're going to hell. Ask me why. You know? <laughs> And he would, he would crack up conversations with everybody. Knew, didn't know what he was talking about. He would approach people. You know, you know the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he, he gave his only uh, belated son, that, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have, uh, you know, extra life. And, and they'd be like, That's in the Bible. Yeah, man, it's in the Bible. And, and they'd be like, Well, I'll come to church with you. Like he just, he had no competence, but he had confidence. And he would get people saved. And then you have someone who t- has taken every course, gone to Bible school and taken every course and studied and studied, like all the different ways of getting people saved. And they walk up to people like, you want to know about Jesus? And they just they don't have the confidence. And God wants you to be confident in whatever he's called you to do because his glory is shining through you. And so in our journey, he wants to reveal us to ourselves as well as revealing himself to us. Right? And we have to interpret the scripture correctly. And unfortunately, our foundation for interpretation lies in our child and how we were raised. But but God's word has the power to transform the way we think. It can change our past. Amen? And so I want to read a passage of scripture here as we're getting ready to close here. In Exodus chapter 4. Verse 1 to 14. And this is good because this is, this is Moses. Now Moses is being called of God. He's at the burning bush and God's saying, Hey, listen, I want you to go back and deliver like a million people. Okay? Uh, out, out of the hands of the Egyptians. And Moses is like, doesn't know what to do. So, but Moses protests again. What if, what if they won't believe in me, Lord? What if they don't listen to me? What if they say, Lord, never appeared to you? What, what am I going to say then? Then the Lord asked him, what is it that's in your hand? And so Moses, well, it's a shepherd's staff, right? Next verse. Throw it down on the ground, and the Lord told him. So Moses threw it down the staff, and it turned into a snake, and Moses jumped back. Like, if, if I dropped a, a staff and it turned into a snake, I'd be pretty, I don't like snakes. I hate snakes. And, and I'm telling you that, don't come to church with a snake, because you'll freak me out. But I was in the backyard the other day, and I almost stepped on one, and I was sounded like a little girl. Like, I do not like snakes. Tarantulas, no problem. Snakes, I don't like. But this thing turns into a snake. Next verse. All right. Verse 5. Okay. Perform this sign, the Lord told him, and then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob really has appeared to you. That's pretty good. Next verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out again, his hand was as white as snow with a severe skin disease. So he did this, pulled it out. I mean, that's pretty cool. Next verse. Okay, now, I don't have the scripture, so bring it up. Next verse, verse 8. It's coming? There we go. The Lord said to Moses, If they don't believe you, and they're not convinced by the first miraculous sign, they will be convinced by the second. So God's saying, hey, they're going to be convinced. Let's go on. And uh, if they don't believe you or listen to you after this, then take some water from the Nile River, pour it out on the dry ground. Then when you do this, the water from the Nile will turn to blood on the ground. That is pretty cool. All right? 
And, and here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I don't know about you, but wouldn't that be cool to have that in your arsenal? Like if you're going out to talk to people about God, you need to believe in God. And they're like, I don't believe. Well, watch this. You drop your stick and it turns into a serpent, man. They would freak. They would get, what must I do to be saved? Right? Or you pull out a zombie hand. Check this out. They would freak. Or, or you take their water bottle. Watch this. You know, turning into blood. And man, people would be like, you, you, we'd have the biggest church in all of Trenton. I'm telling you, people would get saved. They'd be like, man, this God is awesome. But, but those are some pretty cool things. And then look what, what Moses says. And he says, but Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and, uh, and I'm not now, even though you've spoken to me. I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled, okay? And so he's concerned about maybe he stutters, right? And then the Lord asked Moses, who made a person's mouth? Like I just told you, I'm going to give you an arsenal of three things, a snake stick, a zombie hand, and a blood bottle. And you're talking about, you know, your mouth. And he says, who decided whether per- people speak or not or don't speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Am I not the Lord? Now go, and I will be with you as you speak. I will instruct you in what to say. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, the snake stick, the zombie hand, and the blood bottle is not enough. I I can't do this. Send someone else, Lord. I would have been so cool with those three signs. I would have been like, yeah, I'll do it. No problem. This is awesome. You're going to call me an avenger. This is awesome. And then the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? Okay, so the Lord became angry. Why? Because he didn't believe that God was right in his discernment about Moses' ability. And sometimes we don't believe the greatness that's in us, that God has put there. We don't believe in it. And in not believing in the greatness God put in us, we're not believing in God's faithfulness. Amen? Aaron and the Levite, I know he speaks well and and how he looks. He's on his way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. And so now all of a sudden he's got his brother tagging along. And I would have liked to do ministry without my brother tagging along. How many know what I'm talking about? But now because of his lack of faith. And here's the issue. You've got to go back now. He grew up in the house of Pharaoh. He was adopted into a family. He was a prince of Egypt. And he was rejected. And he was cast into the, the desert. And how many know rejection will affect you? But the word of the Lord, if we'll trust in will save us from rejection. Amen? Amen. And so God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. Um, There's two things that you need to do if you want to purge yourself of lack of confidence and rejection. Number one, speak God's word. Murmur to yourself what God's word says. Because we we always meditate. We murmur to ourselves, oh, I'm so stupid, I shouldn't have did that, I can't believe myself. But God wants us to speak the word. God says, I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things. I'm his child. He loves me as much as he loves Jesus. I feel pretty good about that. And as you begin to meditate on the word, as you meditate your thoughts on the word, your feelings will line up and your faith will grow. The second thing you need to do is um, we need to speak God's word over one another. With the last verse, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, We need to stop using God's word as a weapon, but we have to use it as a healing bomb. The word of God was never intended to be a weapon that we use against one another. The word of God is intended to be a weapon against the enemy, spiritual weapon, but not against one another. The Bible says, he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Amen? And... I want to leave you guys before, we're going to have a time of prayer, but before, I want to give you a homework assignment. Can we do that? I'm going to ask everyone in this church to fast this week, but not food. I want you to fast negative thoughts. I want you to say, if you get a negative thought, say, no, no, I, I, I've made a decision to fast, and I'm going to think something positive. If you see someone who irritates you, and, you, and your pattern is to think negatively about that person, Try to find something good that you can like in that person and think about that. But make this a week and say, I'm going to do my best with the grace of God to fast negative thoughts and I'm going to think only positive thoughts, okay? And then I want you to speak words of strength, encouragement, and comfort to yourself and to others. Okay? So say with me, no negativity this week. All right? And so I want you to do that. Talk to yourself. 
Say positive things to yourself. Say positive things to others. And as you do something like this, what you're doing is you're prophesying. You're speaking words of comfort, edification, and strength to people, right? Amen. Why don't we stand? And just ask uh, Bianca, if you could just come to the keyboard for a second. Did anyone receive anything from God today? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, Father, we come before you today, Lord. And I don't feel to have an altar call on this right now. I just, I just really feel that you're speaking to hearts today, God. Lord, that we would have our eyes open to understand that you love us as much as you love Jesus. You love us so much. You care for us. I pray, God, that you would speak to everyone's heart this week, that you would, you would just, just reveal to them their purpose, their destiny, and their plan what you have in store for them, Lord. I pray for, for courage to come. We command rejection to leave, God. I thank you, Father, this week as we're reading the Scripture that we're going to see with the eyes of our understanding the love of God and, and the faithfulness of our God through the lenses of our spirit, God. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen.